appreciate that. Uh, Josie and Rashawn, thank you for the inspiration. It's incredible. I wish I was one-tenth of as impressive as those kids were as high school students. Okay. Um, they really have their stuff together. And thank you, Christine. I uh, really look forward to your reporting from the Paris Olympics and Paralympics this year. This is what your, I don't know, 24th Olympics or 36th <laughs> Olympics. I'm not sure there is an Olympics without uh, Christine Brennan. Her reporting has been so good. Um, the, uh, I think we can also write the first headline of the Olympics and Paralympics, which is that America wins. Team USA will top the medal count just as it has in every Summer Olympics since 1996 after the Eastern Bloc fell apart. We're gonna do well in the Paralympics again, too. We're also gonna be inspired. I'm already pumped. Have you seen the, uh, the, the video, the, the, the hype video uh, from Team USA? Can we show it? If you want to see what this team is made of, just look at the people around you. It's in every Fred, every Adeline, and every Brittany. It's in all of us. In the first timers, and the greatest of all timers. The underdog lovers, and the overachievers. The people like you, and people not like you. In this America, and that America, and our America. The amazing thing is, no matter how many parts there are, just one of us can do it for all of us. Guys pumped? <laughs> yeah. I love that messaging because it, it recognizes how the treetops are connected to the grassroots, how the elite flows from the everyday, that we're all really in this together. But the truth is we can win at the Olympics and still get it wrong at the base. Our country is that large, that wealthy, with so much diversity in our population and our recreational infrastructure, both natural and human made, that we don't really need an efficient sports system to move Americans from the pipeline to the podium. We can throw eggs against the wall, see which ones don't break, and still put a pretty good team out there. Doesn't mean that happens in every case, but that's, that's the, uh, the context to which we're um, you know, creating champions. Um, but we do need to be thoughtful if we're going to, to win at the base, if we hope to make sport an experience that develops the human and athletic potential of every child, if we're going to spark a love of game and foster physical literacy that lasts into adulthood, if we're gonna reduce the amount of abuse that some children face from coaches, parents, and other adults, if we're going to reverse the youth sport participation rates that have declined since the pandemic, and if we have any chance of reaching the public health target of 63% participation by 2030. What's possible by the 2028 Olympics and Paralympics in Los Angeles? Can we tell the story um, to the rest of the world about American sports that were solid at both the top and the bottom? I think we can, but we can't program our way to a better place. We need policy, policy that addresses fundamental flaws in our youth sports system. And, the, and chief among those fundamental flaws is that we're sorting the weak from the strong well before they grow into their bodies, their minds, and their true interests. The moment we create these so-called travel teams at ever earlier ages, the late bloomer, the kid from the lower income home, the kid from the single parent home whose mom or dad may not be able to drive them to the endless array of uh, practices 12 months a year, uh, you know, that might be you know, two counties or two states away. Um, we have problems when that happens. And then we heap high doses uh, of one sport on the kids who are still left in the system. You know, and bodies break down, uh, kids lose interest, and after a decade, too many kids just want to kind of play guitar or chase boys or girls or whatever interest they may have. 
you know, you get this. A year ago, uh, Baltimore's Jason Gay, who may be with us here today of the Wall Street Journal, tweeted on this observation. The tweet received 1,700 reposts and 8,000 likes. Not Kardashian numbers, but hey, still kind of interesting in our space. Nearly all of the more than 200 comments agreed with the insight that we have a system and that has this fundamental flaw. And systems, systems are shaped by policy. And the policies that shape you sports, some have been great. Title IX, raise your hand if you think Title IX has been a plus, a benefit in our society. Right? The Land and Water Conservation Act. Did you know that proceeds from oil drilling from the, from the Gulf of Mexico have been used to build more than 40,000 uh, sport and recreational facilities around the country in every state and possibly every county? You've, if you played sports, you probably played on a space that has been made possible by uh, the land and water conservation uh, funds. And those aren't even federal dollars. They're just, it's, it's a slice of oil drilling money that has helped build our sports system. These are good things, but we do have gaps. <clears throat> and we're not pulling the pieces together in a manner that preserves access, protects kids, and produce, produces the real results that we're hoping for. That's why last year I reached out to Ashley Huffman to help us get the process started. Ashley had uh, just left her post as chief of, this, of uh, sport diplomacy at the US State Department. Um, and step one for us was research on what's working in peer countries. Um, last fall, we published a report on the world's leading sports systems, a comparative analysis of 12 countries. The grade for youth sport participation that you see here correlates to the participation rate. So just over half of our kids play sports, so we get a C. Other countries have higher grades, other countries have lower grades. The government support grade is a subjective measure based on the opinion of experts in that country, how well they think gov the government supports youth sports. The D grade you see here is, uh, was given by attendees at the Next Up conference when we asked them, room similarly sized here, uh, what, what grade they would give. So where to from here? We think it's time to create the nation's first ever youth sports policy agenda, a framework and a set of ideas that the Project Play Network can rally around. Ash, can you help us explore those next steps? Uh Who's excited about policy? Woo! It's the end of a rainy day, and we are going to bring the sunshine right here to this group. So uh, thank you all for sticking around. Um, let me just introduce the panelists, and I'll share a little bit about our process, and then we'll dive into some questions. So first up, furthest away from me, Dr. Katrina Piercy from the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services. She is the Director of Disease Prevention. This should deserve an ovation because she works for the government, so I'm going to give you one. <laughs> um, then we have Jeremy Goldberg, who is probably most famously known as the president of League Apps, but also a flag football coach for youth. So I also feel like that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> and then, last but not least, Tatiana McFadden, a Maryland native and a 20-time Paralympic medalist. So thank, thank you, you, Tatiana. Hey, nice. Thank you. <laughs> oh, such a good group. Um, so I just wanted to walk through when I joined the Aspen team, kind of what the process was. I don't know if anybody was tracking the Olympic and Paralympic Commission and the hearing and the report. So just by show of hands, even though I can't really see anybody, uh, just by show of hands, there's a few people that were watching that. And so essentially, uh, Jeremy, Tom, Vince, who you know from Aspen, Katrina submitted some things. There were several people in this room involved presenting at the lone public hearing uh, in front of Congress and in front of the commission on Olympic and Paralympic reform. And from that, Friday, March 1st, who releases a 277-page document on Friday, uh, ruined my weekend plans, uh, they dropped the report that then had all of these like 12 fundamental changes that need to happen in, in our sport ecosystem, especially as it relates to Olympics and Paralympics. So Tom and I spent the weekend digesting that. We then put together, uh, you know, a an analysis of that, some five takeaways, five things that, that, you know, that were great and five things that we could build on. And then from there, we created a federal working group, so just kind of an advisory group. And 
Jared Cooper, forgive me if your name is, if your face is not on here, but Jared Cooper was an all-star on this panel as well. And just incredible people from all different sectors and different experiences and generations and people who, are, who know how to work the hill because I will tell you, you know, if you don't know how to play the game, you're not going to win the game. And so we had some hill folks on here. We have sports industry people on here and just an incredible amount of expertise and we took those ideas and we tried to like boil the ocean right because everything needs fixed uh, and then put together a youth sport agenda and those three things that we're really trying to focus on a three-prong attack keep kids safe make sport accessible and govern sport better and so thinking about keep kids safe injury burnout abuse prevention in the words of Kevin Plank protect this house right uh, the second piece uh, make sport accessible. So can it be community centered? Can it be affordable? Can our kids going to be able to play? And then the third piece, govern sport better. How do we hold folks accountable? You can have all the policies in the world, but if no one's enforcing them, policies are just fall on deaf ears. So how do we move the needle in this on these three areas? And knowing that everyone in this room has a role to play. Everyone is already doing such great work. So finding a way in one of those columns to action I think is really important. So I'm going to start with Katrina. I think there were a lot of things that came out uh, whenever the commission report was launched and I think even Ted Cruz was like no one wants the federal government to take over Little League, you know, crazy. Uh, so can you talk about the federal government's role uh, in sport currently and like what could be done, what's already being done, and what could be done? What could federal government involvement look like? Sure, great question. And first off, no one I think is asking for a federal government takeover of sports. Um, <laughs> this was a, a, a big topic that we actually got a lot of feedback on when we put out the National Youth Sports Strategy, and people said, where's the Ministry of Sport? Other countries have that. But I think we've got to look at what we have in this country and what makes sense. And I think from my seat at the US Department of Health and Human Services, we don't see our role in youth sports in the playing field. That's happening at the local level. That's happening with you all and the programming that you're doing within your communities. I do think there is a role for government in this space. And one of the big pieces that we've been in, you probably heard about this earlier, when Tom talked about the 63 by 30. That's data from the Health Resources um, Services Administration looking at youth sports participation each year. And we rolled that into a Healthy People 2030 strategy. Um, so every 10 years, we set objectives for the nation to improve the health and well-being of our country. And so youth sports was just added in the last edition. And so now we're tracking that piece. So that 63% that Tom talked about, that is our marker, our North Star. Um, when we look at youth sports participation, when we first set this at the beginning of the decade in 2020, we were at 58%. It dropped down to 50 in COVID, and now we're up to we're moving towards, hopefully, towards that 63%. And so there's the role that we see of government that we have this bird's eye view to take a look and say, where is this happening and where is it not? Where are the disparities for youth sports participation? Because if you look at that data, anything that feeds into healthy people is a publicly available, nationally representative data set. So you can take that and stratify down and look at race, ethnicity, household income, education status, and see where does this feed in for your community. And by having that bird's eye view, we can see where are the gaps. Our goal is 63%, but you've got to flip the other side of that. That still means 37% of kids are not playing sports across a whole year. We know all of these benefits. And so this is one of the, the key roles that we see ourselves on the federal side to kind of set this marker and ask all of us to come behind that and collectively work to move that needle towards there. Yeah, and I think having straddled, you know, both worlds, where I right? like being in government, being in sport, we all know that if you're not in the budget, if you're not a line item, if you don't have a seat at the table, it's really difficult to even have these conversations, right? So maybe if you could just speak to, you know, the role that your office plays currently and just like how that would help bolster domestic sport and physical activity. Sure. So one of the big pieces, obviously, is, like, is the data surveillance and setting kind of what does success look like. We also have the national um, youth sports policy that we're looking at lifting up the programs and what's happening through NYSS champions. So many of your organizations are a part of that. Um, the Aspen Institute, League Apps, and others that we're kind of looking to find the success stories and lift them up 
and elevate that work um, to kind of scale this model. Because there's lots of great work that's happening, and it's meetings like this where we can come together and say, okay, how is this working? How is this happening? How do we lift this up? You know, also through work at the President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition, we announced in February a partnership with 16 um, players associations and leagues, another way to amplify the messaging and alignment. We're trying to work with everyone so that we're collectively all moving in the same direction. And also, hopefully in the future, and this is what the commission report pointed to, of an opportunity of, is there a way to have a, a government or a quasi-government agency that's helping from the grant side of things? Because I know that's a big piece of this too. And, and how do we find what is working, what organizations are following these best practices that can be given more fuel to help uh, expand and reach and, and really at the end of the day, help more kids play? Great, thank you so much. And it's, Tatiana, I'm coming back to you, but the grants program, when you mentioned it, it made me want to go to Jeremy because you've been working a lot on trying to create legislation as part of like grants to community orgs. So can you share a little bit about like what you would like to see in the youth sports policy agenda and just how you can translate something like policy into action? Yeah, I well, appreciate that. And maybe, maybe just start with a quick poll. Raise your hand if your organization could use more resources or make it easier to have more funding to do your work. <laughs> right, so very clearly, so <laughs> bipartisan, a lot of support for this. So one thing I think I start with the assumption is that youth sports is a, is a massively under-resourced sector. And in some cases, it's a victim of its own success, right? It has incredible education outcomes. It affects health outcomes, right? Some people connect it in mental health, physical health, military readiness. So in many cases, it's like what budget does it fit into? And so one of the things about youth sports is if it's an under-resourced sector, what's the way to make sure that there's resources that flow into the sector? Government can play some of that role. And in some cases, if the government is ensuring those resources flow, it sends a signal to the private sector, to foundations, to also fund this as a category, so that youth sports is not simply viewed as games, but it's, usually, it's, it's really about helping people win at life. So one is starting with that assumption that if we can make the case, and in many cases have a dedicated grant program, it ensures those dollars flow into the sector. The second thing then is, is how do you design the grant program to make sure resources go to where they need to go, right? Because when you think about even bigger programs like the Land Water Conservation Act, in many cases, it's, it's, it's so technical, it's so hard to get those funds that they're really not accessible to the organizations, especially grassroots organizations doing the work. So what we've tried to do is think about what is the, the grants programs that allow that to happen. So uh, through the opportunity I have to, to help co-chair the Play Sports Coalition um, with a, a bunch of incredible folks, we really try to attack tackle this grants question at the federal and the state level. At the state level, there's, I think, five different states now that have unlocked dollars that go directly to program providers. So cutting directly through all the other intermediaries and getting those funds directly to organizations that are doing the work on the ground. We were able to see this firsthand in the case of Massachusetts and Maryland, where those states actually gave the Play Sports Coalition those funds. And with the help of, of the Play Equity Foundation and L84, Laureus, uh, and others, uh, we were able to actually turn around and grant those program, those dollars from the point of receipt um, to actually receipt to, uh, ni within 90 days. So the ability to get those dollars flowing directly to providers is really important. And now we're trying to imagine that at the federal level. So the Play Sports Act is, would create a $75 million fund to go directly to youth sports organizations. Um, and uh, looking at that as a mechanism through the CDC uh, with bipartisan support with Congressman Allred, um, with Congressman Fitzpatrick, as well as Debbie Wasserman Sultz. And uh, we see a lot of opportunities to expand on that. So if we get more dollars into the system at the federal and the state level to organizations that are doing the hard work, that's a, a necessary, maybe not sufficient, but necessary uh, part of the solution here to make youth sports better. Yeah, and just for folks to understand, you know, legislation is hard to pass, and it's a big bureaucratic crag, uh, you know, that you have to mm, work your way through. So just curious, like, what are some of the things that you've learned doing this work on the Hill? How, do you, how have you taken it in bite-sized chunks? Like, what do you think is possible for this year? I know you can't control everything, but what do you think is realistic for this year? Yeah, you know, one, one thing, I think if you set up an ambitious goal, right, there's no reason why we can't figure out how over the next number of years to unlock a billion dollars to be funding into this sector um, with institutional level support. So you, you set this goal, and then to your point, it's, it's bite-sized chunk. So one thing we did, actually borrowing it from a playbook that the Aspen Institute uh, surfaced, was looking where there's new sources of revenue. Because if new revenue is coming up, then it's not already claimed, versus trying to get money out of existing budget allocations. So where mobile sports betting was being legalized at the state level, this was actually an Aspen Institute report they put out, and it started in New York State, we then would engage with policymakers, we would bring local organizations in those communities to testify about the importance of sports, 
as well as other experts like Benita Fitzgerald Mosley to talk about why sports mattered. And it turns out if you make the case, the data, the stories is so compelling, we were able to have a lot of success. As recently as last week in Connecticut, a 2% of mobile sports betting in the budget, if it passes, would go to youth sports. So in New York State, uh, among others, there's a bunch of other states that are looking at this. So a lot of it's about making the case, about connecting people to local voices, and then if you can do that, it's irresistible to understand the power of what sports can offer. And a lot of this is about what sports is about, right? Roll up your sleeves and grind it out, right? What, what's the individual conversations to make it work? And if you're not afraid of that, 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 that grit, then ultimately you can have success. And so we've seen the same thing at the federal level, right? This isn't about federal takeovers. This is about making sure that every kid has access and everybody can relate through their own experience and through the experience of their constituents. Thank you for that. I know someone who is not shy to do some hard work. So let me turn it over to you, Tatiana. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the work that you have been doing and what role you see the government could play um, either in the policy landscape or beyond school systems, et cetera, to play to create greater accessibility? Yeah, um, thank you, Aspen, so much for having me here. And I'm going to give you a perspective of a young 15-year-old. Um, she came home from Athens in 2004, and she was going to start high school. <laughs> and I was very anxious to start high school, as any 15-year-old would be. And all I wanted to do was, was high school track. Like, I was obsessed at that point. I mean, I came home with a silver and bronze medal. And I know that high school track is not in tryout sport. You do need to be on the, um, the honor roll to be part of it. Um, but I, when I was trying to join, I realized that I was denied a uniform, denied the right to race mm -hmm. alongside of others, um, use the same bus. Um, and so I was devastated at a 15-year-old. I mean, when I went to track meet, they stopped the entire meet, had me go around, and then they continued the clap, uh, you know, then they continued the track meet. And I thought, wow, like coming home from a silver and bronze medal, like it's a little humiliating and maybe insulting. Um, and I was the only female wheelchair racer in Howard County at Appleton um, ra racing. And so I went to my mom and my mom's an amazing woman. I mean, she was one of the 12 authors of the ADA. And I was like, mom, like I, I tried talking to them about, you know, participating in high school sports, and my mom's like, okay, like, I'll call them and, and see, you know, what we'll, what we can do, and they didn't budge. Mm -hmm. And so the last resort was literally to sue, and we sued for no money. We sued for opportunity um, for the rights of people with disabilities to participate in high school sports. And because we sued for no money, <laughs> thank you. And because we sued for you no know, money, I mean, it played out in headlines everywhere, like all over the U.S. I mean, and the Washington Post. I had, you know, teammates um, say, you know, and others, you know, people with disabilities should, you know, participate in their sports of their own kind and not be included in high school sports. And so luckily with the judge on my side, we won. And I say that very casually, it was like really hard work, but we, we won and we, write for, we won for the right for people with disabilities to participate in high school sports. So, you know, you asked me what can laws do and laws are supposed to prevent discrimination, mm -hmm. like to me, and laws are supposed to take, pol uh, support equal access and acknowledge the equal rights for people with disabilities that we were missing during that time. And the, and the fact that this is good for the general population and that all, everyone, I mean, high school is supposed to be inclusive. And so every single student, you know, sports is so important and we know that. We know that it's good for physical health and we know that it's good for, for the mental health too and to be part of something. And, um, you know, when I was denied today, I, I can see the kids are participating in high school more. We're seeing more young girls with physical disabilities out. And we're seeing, you know, growth in numbers of healthier, you know, Americans, people with disabilities because they are participating in high school sports. So that's one, some reasons that laws can, can help in case like this. Yeah, I think that's a pretty <laughs> successful example. Um, I mean, high school is just so fun anyway, you know, belonging, that's, that's not easy to do, so, you know. <laughs>
let's just all be discriminatory. Um, so what more can be done to ensure athletes are not discriminated against, athletes with disabilities? Like, I know there are, what, 23, 28 university programs now? Some, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Right, like that's a great start. It's not, not enough. Uh, so what else can be done to prevent discrimination, both at the high school and university level, so that there's a better pipeline for people like you? So remember that this law is in place. Um, it's very, you know, people can still go around it. Um, and so it's really important that, you know, people um, use and respect this law. And also it's really important too for parents, coaches, teammates, other, you know, athletes with disabilities to know how to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and there's eight easy steps. It's on true sports. Coaches, I'm sure, have to go through true sports. But it's teach the kids early that everyone's unique teach them that, to find a common ground amongst each other, remind kids to focus on the process and not the outcome, use the right words, especially if you're talking to someone you know, with a disability, help your child to understand how to help, you know, maybe without overstepping, teach your kids to how to ask questions the right way, teach these kids to stay alert and understand their curiosity. I mean, this conversation is so important for everyone, but especially with people with disabilities, because some people, you might not understand, you know, how can I help this athlete? How can we talk to them? And so this education is, um, is out on True Sports, and it's a great tool to get online and, and use the, the resources, something like this, follow the eight steps. And um, also, you know, I think following the Paralympics, maybe following me, not to like, you know, promote myself. <laughs> um, and, you know, continue the conversation because having me here today, I, th story is, stories are so important. The power of storytelling is huge. So like today I'll go home and, you know, tell your story, your story, what you're doing and vice versa. And that's how the conversation just keeps going. Um, and before we know, it's going to help boost it all up. Yeah, thank you for that. I'll definitely be watching Paris 2024. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. Um, if I had to kick it to each of you to say, you know, because I promised we'd bring some sunshine. If I had to kick it to you all to say one thing that gives you hope around having, you know, these conversations or an agenda or moving in policy in a policy direction, what's one thing that really gives you hope for the next year? I think it's conversations like this. It's bringing together everyone with this collective efforts and it might be different outcomes that we're pointing to as Jeremy said, the mental health or military readiness or just overall physical health. But I think collectively we all want our nation's youth to grow up healthier. And frankly, right now about 50% of them are playing sports and that's not okay. So, but I think everyone's collective energy and, and want to make this go better gives me hope. I think what gives me hope is that if we can all align on what it is that we're asking for, um, that we have the ability to drive change um, within policymakers. And I, the reason which gives me that conviction is you can think all, about, all the time about what certain kinds of policies that pass, but very few of those areas have the universal um, power of what sports has to offer, right? At a time of such division, sports is one of the things that actually connects us, humanizes us. The power of sports, the transformative ways it affects people, not when just they're playing, but the lifetime effects are so profound that we have an amazing story to tell. And so if we can unify what it is we're asking for, understand some of the dynamics um, when it comes to what we're, we're targeting, then I'm very confident that if we bring that case, that people will listen, and that ultimately that will lead to action. And I think I commend the Aspen Institute, you and Tom, and everyone else that's, that's helping us to try to align on what that policy message is. And I'm excited for the Play Sports Coalition and many others to play their part to then take that case uh, and ultimately make things happen. And when you work together as a team, uh, you can win. Um, I think for me, I think it's um, the, hopefully the young people can feel inspired, um, you know, having um, my, I say my law, like I own it, but having the Sports and Fitness um, Equity Act out. And, you know, I think having organizations, you know, like Aspen and, and Move United and um, the understanding of, you know, high school kids together, participating together. I think it's going to change the conversation. It's going to change the narrative because when my sister didn't have to fight for the mm -hmm. right to be part of high school sports, she just naturally, like, flowed right in. You know, she, all the kids went to go sit with her. Um, everyone cheered her on. They didn't look at her as someone 
who is different, you know? I may stick out like a sore thumb because I'm in a wheelchair, but there's all different types of, of disabilities and there are hidden disabilities and they should have the right to participate in high school sports. And so I was really, really happy that when I came home from college and went to go cheer her on in track competitions, it was really nice to see that. And I think it does give hope and inspiration and you know, for the games, uh, Paralympics coming up and the Olympics coming up and the WNBA being so awesome, uh, just so amazing and inspiring. I really hope that the younger generation can say, oh, I want to try, try sports. Yeah, they will lead us forward. It'll be great. Um, I think for me, what gives me hope is the fact that we're going to host 10 major events in 10 years and that we have all of these opportunities to invite the world to the United States and what will we do with it? What story will we tell? We have an opportunity to define ourselves. And, you know, we did a lot of finger wagging in the last couple, five years at China and Russia and Qatar. And, you know, we've said a lot of things. And so we have a chance to really get it right. And I hope this is the start of that. And so, um, you know, Aspen will really play the role of like the puzzle keeper, right? We'll have all of the educational meetings on the Hill. We want to have a um, resounding drumbeat around these ideas of safety, accessibility, and governance, and think that everyone has a role to play in that. Like, if you think about social justice theory, this is coming to my brain, if you think about social justice theory and the four Ps that really make that up, policy, programs, public advocacy, and press, we all have the ability in some way to touch on one of those four Ps to change hearts and minds change culture and change the way the system looks. So the next piece of this is to, is to go ahead and log into the Slido. The first question is, after listening to this panel, how important is it that Project Play create a youth sports policy agenda? So if you can log in to Slido now and go ahead and register your vote, that means I'm going to get to moderate another session next year. <laughs> Thank you guys. All right. So I appreciate that. Um, Second question, what ideas do you want to see in the youth sports policy agenda? So our second question there is a fill in the blank. Oh, no. Which of these areas of policy would you be most interested in engaging? Okay. I'll give you some time to weigh in here. So what policy ideas do you want to see in the youth sports policy agenda? This is a fill in the blank opportunity. So go ahead and fill in things that resonate with you. Give me time to type. Safety, coach training mandate, equity, safeguarding, sports for all funding, local leagues, equity, lots of shouts out for equity, requiring funding for coach training, coaching support, coach, 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 mm -hmm. make sport accessible, accessibility, abuse prevention. Those are all great. Thank you for weighing in on this. Keep yeah, Coach Education, three stars. Who, who found the emojis? Excellent. Um, <laughs> so our next piece is, just so you all know next steps, um, we've already had five or six meetings on the Hill just to try to understand how this game works, right, so that we can be successful at it and can't play checkers while everyone else is playing chess. So we've had a couple of meetings to try to understand, and then we will continue to create documents. We have the one-pager, which we shared a little nugget. Um, we'll create a, compa a companion piece, which will be featured on the sport and policy part of the Aspen website. Uh, and then we'll just continue to churn out research. And then we would love for you all to also be involved in thinking about inviting policymakers out to see your programs or getting the press involved or doing some public advocacy work or taking part in Hill Days. So just be thinking about the role you can play. And we, we really think it takes all of us and that everyone has a really special place in this movement. So thanks so much.